the next chapter concurrency control we uh, what is concurrency control it's how the system controls access to resources and there are two things which are typically done first of all uh, there is a usually a locking system um, which l lets you uh, prevent concurrent access but on top of it there is usually a protocol which is followed and we will see these so there are many protocols some of them are based purely on locking some are uh, based on other mechanisms uh, and the idea is that there are some underlying things which are used and a protocol is a set of rules which you must follow in order to prevent problems so first of all what is a lock a lock is a mechanism to control concurrent access to a data item so a data item can be locked in in the context of databases there are usually two modes exclusive and shared mode so the idea is you have a lock manager and the protocol locking protocol should ask the lock manager uh, it can tell the lock manager please give me a lock on a particular data item in exclusive mode and the lock manager can say okay you have the exclusive mode lock or it can say give me a lock on this thing in shared mode and the lock manager may say you have the lock in shared mode the lock manager has to ensure that you know it's if one person has an exclusive lock nobody else can concurrently have a shared lock or an exclusive lock for that matter exclusive lock means that if one transaction has an exclusive lock no transaction can have any other lock on that data item all others who have asked for locks can be asked to wait and be told that maybe we'll give you the lock after some time right now you cannot get the lock that's what the lock manager does so if somebody already has a lock in shared mode a transaction asked for exclusive mode the lock manager cannot grant it at this time it will make it wait and once the shared locks are released then this transaction can get an exclusive lock just one transaction can get the exclusive lock others have to wait so that's a notion of locking so here is a a uh, lock compatibility matrix a uh, compatible means that two transactions can have compatible locks on the same data item so s and s are compatible so two transactions can have shared locks on the same data item at the same time all the rest are false which means if one transaction has an x lock no other transaction will get either an s lock or an x lock on the same data item and by the way the table is symmetric what this means is doesn't matter which came first Uh, if s lock came first x lock came later x has to wait if x lock came first and then an s lock request came then the s lock request has to wait okay so that's the basic idea so now um the minimum requirement with locking is that before you read you better get a lock before you write you better get a lock and the lock has to be of a appropriate type so before you read you better get a shared lock lock s on that data item now here is a transaction which performs locking but it can still get into trouble as we will see so you need something more than just plain locking so what it's doing is before reading it gets an s lock it reads it then it unlocks then it proceeds to s lock b read it and unlock and then it displays the total a plus b so it is doing locking it is doing something which is essential that when you read a data item you better have an s lock on it turns out this is not enough it's not enough to guarantee serializability and what can go wrong here supposing in between this step and this step now note that there are concurrent things going on in the database so as soon as this unlock happens maybe the cpu uh, control gets transferred to another transaction and let's see what that transaction does let's say that transaction transfers $50 from a to b right here in this gap between unlock and lock this gap can be long period of time before this transaction gets another chance in this interval another transaction comes in transfers $50 from a to b if you look at the total display it's not consistent it's not um uh, the total here a plus b is not consistent uh, why because when you read a the amount had not been transferred when you read b the amount had been transferred 
So, the total here is 50 dollars more than it should be. You are seeing an inconsistent result, it is not serializable if you just do this much. So, what you need is not just locking, but a protocol and that protocol is what is called two phase locking. Um, I am going to come back to the starvation and deadlock. I will skip those slides for just a moment. And uh, so, look at the two phase locking protocol. In the two phase locking protocol, uh, there is a growing phase during which transactions can obtain locks, it cannot release any locks. After that, the transaction can continue doing some work for a while and then it enters the shrinking phase, meaning in this phase, it may release locks, but it may not obtain any new locks. So, this is the protocol. First of all, you have to get read locks before you read, write locks before you, uh, exclusive locks before you write, that is required. In addition, what this is saying is, in the first phase, you can keep obtaining locks, but the moment you release even one lock, you cannot obtain any more locks. After this, you can continue running but you, and releasing locks uh, till the end, but you cannot acquire a single new lock. And the point is that once you have uh, released a lock on an item, you cannot uh, read or write that item. And if you have a new item which you want to read or write, you cannot because you cannot acquire any new locks. So, the basic idea is very simple. This initial phase you can ask for locks, later on you can release them, but you cannot ask for any new locks. And this particular protocol can be shown to ensure serializability. I won't try to prove it for lack of time, but it is actually pretty easy to show. And it is very easy to show that transactions can be serialized in the order of their lock point. What is the lock point? It is a point where the transaction acquired its final lock. In fact, any point between here where it acquired the final lock to the point where it released even one lock, the first lock release. From the last lock acquired to the lock release, any point in between is actually fine. That can be called the lock point and you can show that transactions can be serialized in the order of their lock point. Now, that is very good, but it is not enough. Um, so, I will come back to deadlocks uh, in a moment, but two phase locking does not ensure freedom from deadlock. That is okay, we can live with that, uh, but there is something worse. Um, the first is that uh, cascading rollback is possible. Um, so, why can that happen? In fact, uh, something worse can even happen. Um, here, uh, if you go back here, a transaction might release an exclusive lock somewhere here and then another transaction may get a lock on that data item and read it. What has just happened? You released a lock, an exclusive lock before you committed and another transaction can come and acquire that lock and read. So, you, you, you may even land up with a non-recoverable schedule. So, the strict two phase locking does the following, it holds all exclusive locks till it commits or aborts, okay. Until then it cannot release any exclusive locks, it can release shared locks, but not exclusive locks, okay. Um, so, that is something which you have to uh, keep in mind. Now, there is another uh, variant of this, where you not only hold exclusive locks till the end, but you hold all locks till the end. And this is called rigorous two phase locking. This has the extra property that the order in which transactions commit will be the order of their serialization. Now, without this extra thing, that is, if you release uh, read locks early, you are still uh, serializable, but the serialization order may not match the commit order. In other words, uh, a transaction which committed earlier might come later in the serial order. Um, so, uh, if you do not want that to happen, users may not be happy about it, then you should hold all locks till the end. In fact, if you see actual implementations, they tend to hold all locks till the end, because they usually do not give you a convenient way to say release the locks in between. So, practically most lock based implementations actually implement rigorous. Again, there is some terminology uh, difference between different papers and books. So, in the industry, people say strict two phase locking. When they say that more often than not, they mean this what our textbook calls rigorous two phase locking. So, this terminology was taken from some original research papers which defined these terms. They were supposed 
to be a definitive paper. But in industry, people went ahead and started using the term strict two-phase locking to mean what uh, we call rigorous two-phase locking. That is, all locks are held till the end. Uh, so, if you uh, see uh, somewhere where it, something says a database follows strict two-phase locking, most probably it holds all locks till the end. Okay. So, that is the two-phase locking protocol. It guarantees serializability. Uh, now, before uh, we proceed further, let me point out two issues which any locking protocol has to worry about. The first is deadlock. So, here is an example where uh, transaction T3 uh, read B and wrote B. At this point, it has an exclusive lock on B. Okay. Meanwhile, T4 came along and read A. It has a read lock on A. Then it asks for a lock on B. By the way, this lock S means it is asking for a lock. That is what this means. does not mean it has been granted the lock. It has requested a lock on B. Can this lock on B be granted? No, because T3 has already got an exclusive lock on B. So, this cannot be granted. T4 is waiting at this point. T3 finished writing B and went ahead and now it wants to exclusive lock A. So, it requests lock X on A. Can this lock be granted? No, because T4 has already got an S lock on A. Now, what has happened? T3 is waiting because uh, it needs a lock which T4 holds. So, it is waiting for T4 to release the complete and release the lock. T4, on the other hand, is waiting for a lock that T3 holds. So, it is waiting for T3 to complete and release the locks. Now, clearly, neither of them can make progress. So, we have a deadlock. So, what do we do? First of all, any lock manager should have a built in functionality to detect such deadlocks. And how do you detect it? The lock manager can keep track of who is waiting for who. At this point, since the lock S cannot be granted, uh, the lock manager realizes that T4 is waiting for T3 because T3 has that lock in exclusive mode. At this, at this point, the lock manager also realizes that T3 is waiting for the lock on A, which means it is waiting for T4. So, now there is a cycle. T3 is waiting for T4, T4 is waiting for T3, and there is a cycle which is causing a deadlock. So, the lock manager should detect such cycles uh, which have uh, resulted in a deadlock. Now, what does it do when it detects such an issue? Luckily, uh, databases already support the ability to roll back transactions. So, what the lock manager should do is tell one of T3 or T4 to roll back. So, what does roll back do? It undoes whatever it did and releases the lock. Say T4 is rolled back. Okay, T4 has not done any update. So, it there is really nothing for it to do. It can release the lock on A and now T3 can go ahead and complete. On the other hand, if T3 is rolled back, what does it have to do? It has already written B. So, it has to undo the write of B and then it can release the lock on B after which T4 can continue and complete. So, one of the transactions in a cycle must be rolled back and its locks released. So, that is one issue. The second issue is a less problematic issue, but it can happen if you do not design your system badly, which is starvation. What is starvation? Supposing a transaction is waiting for an X lock on a data item, while somebody else has an X lock. Okay. So, uh, right now, the transaction has to wait. Now, supposing a new transaction comes by which wants an S lock. If you look at the compatibility, the new transaction wants an S lock. Whoever has the lock on it currently is an S lock. It is compatible. So, the new transaction gets an S lock. Say, fine, no problem. Now, a third transaction comes in and also wants an S lock. It gets the S lock. At this point, maybe the first uh, transaction with the S lock has uh, done its work, it commits and goes away. Maybe the second one which uh, got the S lock also commits and goes away, but the one which wants the X lock is still waiting. Now, a fourth transaction comes which also wants an S lock and it is granted the S lock. And this can keep going on and on. Each transaction which wanted the S lock might complete and go away. So, each one of them is finishing, it is not uh, causing an endless wait by itself. But if you see the poor transaction which wanted an X lock, 
it is starving because one after another the other read transactions are uh, going ahead and preventing this from making any progress. So that's one kind of starvation. There's another kind of starvation when uh, due to deadlocks the same transaction is rolled back again and again. Both of these have to be avoided uh, and concurrency control managers can uh, the lock manager rather that part. Concurrency control manager is a bigger system. The subsystem is the lock manager. So the lock manager can ensure this first problem will not occur as follows. Supposing a transaction is waiting for an X lock, it is wanted an X lock and it cannot get it because somebody has an S lock, it is waiting. Most lock managers would do the following. If a new transaction comes in and wants an S lock, they will not allow it to proceed. Yes, the lock is compatible with the existing S lock, but if they allow it, the X lock transaction may starve. Therefore, they will make it wait. In other words, no jumping the queue. If somebody ahead of you in the queue is waiting, you have to stay behind in the queue even if you, you know you are compatible with the current lock on the data item. You have to wait for your turn. So uh, if you prevent queue jumping, starvation is by this means is prevented. The other part, repeated rollback also has to be taken into account during uh, deadlock detection and rollback. I won't get into the details. So so far, what we have seen is uh, the basics of locking, deadlock, starvation, and two-phase locking protocol, which is very widely used. In, in particular, the rigorous form where all locks are held to end. So this is a special case. You can get a lock whenever you ask for it, as long as there is no conflict on that particular data item. And once you get it, you keep the lock until you finish the transaction. And at that point, you can release the locks. This is the most common mechanism which uh, many databases support. Uh, SQL Server supports it, IBM DB2 supports it, uh, MySQL supports it. But there are other protocols uh, which uh, we are going to see briefly, snapshot isolation which uh, Oracle and PostgreSQL. Uh, just uh, wrap up with a few more things about locking. The first thing is if you wrote an SQL query, uh, you are not explicitly saying get locks. So how does the system decide what locks to get? If you have a transaction with a number of SQL queries, the first one may read a data item, the next one may update the same data item. So when you run the first transaction, the database system sees that you are reading it. So it is going to give an S lock. When you run this next, trans uh, next query, which is part of the same transaction, we turned off auto commit. And so the next query is part of the same transaction. It is updating the same data item. So you also need lock conversion. In other words, in the first phase, you can acquire an X lock. You can acquire an X lock on a data item which you have not locked. You can also have a situation where you already have an S lock and now you want an X lock and this is called a upgrading of the lock or lock conversion from S to X. This is acceptable in phase one. Conversely, in phase two, you can release an S lock, you can release an X lock. But you can also do the following. You can downgrade an X lock to an S lock. Now again, most implementations do not uh, support explicit downgrading. Um, but upgrading happens automatically. The more, as, as, you know, whenever you have a SQL query which first reads and then another SQL query which updates the same item or even the same SQL query first reads the data item and then updates it, it can happen. It is not uncommon in fact. Uh, then upgrade will happen. So this slide talks about automatic acquisition of locks. Whenever somebody needs to read, you get a read lock. Whenever you need to write, uh, you get a write lock. This shows some other details. I'm going to skip the details. It's not particularly important. Uh, so there is a lock manager subsystem which uh, does all the handling of locks. So the simplest way to think about it is to think of a lock manager being a separate process to which you can send lock and unlock requests. Uh, this is a perfectly valid implementation, um, but it turns out that you can get much higher performance by not having a separate lock manager process, but instead have a, a lock table which is a data structure which is maintained in shared memory and all the processes in the database system 
uh, can access this shared data structure through a mutex and a library uh, function implements the lock manager functionality. I won't get into details, but that's how it's practically implemented. But you can think of it as being a separate process to which you send messages. A uh, couple of slides on deadlock handling. First of all, once you have locking, deadlocks can occur. There are a few tricks to avoid deadlocks, to prevent deadlocks. One way is to require each transaction pre-declares all the data items which it needs to lock and what are the locks. If it's possible, you know, the problem with this is that when you write an arbitrary transaction, it's hard to predict what all it will access. It's Java code and the database doesn't know what it is. So this is not usually possible. Some cases it's possible. Uh, then there are some other protocols which are based on ordering of data items. And this is a variant of this is actually very useful. So uh, we saw a situation where the following happened. There were two data items, just two data items. Now two transactions, both of which just update these data items. So somebody wrote a transaction T1 like this, uh, write A. There are also reads, I'll forget, don't worry about where, the, assume the reads happen along with the writes, okay. So read plus write here. Now T2 does write B, write A, that's what T2 does. Now supposing the transactions ran one after the other, there would be no problem. But the fact is that both these transactions that get uh, executed repeatedly. So sooner or later, what will happen is you have uh, this part particular ordering. Okay, this happens first, this happens second, this happens third, and then this happens fourth. This can happen. Now what happens? This guy gets an ex exclusive lock on A. This happens second, so he gets an exclusive lock on B. Now this guy wants an exclusive lock on B. He is going to deadlock, uh, not be able to proceed. This guy is still active. It now wants an exclusive lock on A. It cannot proceed because this has a lock. T1 and T2 are waiting for each other now. We have a classic deadlock. Now, it turned out all that needed to be done was T2 was going to be, re, would be rewritten to also access things in the same order. So T2 was rewritten very easily to first access A and then B. And that's all that was required. The moment you do this, deadlocks can never happen. Why? Supposing uh, T1 uh, wrote A and T2 comes along and wants to write A, it is blocked because uh, it can't get the lock. Now uh, T1 can proceed and get the lock on B and complete. T2 cannot interfere. Conversely, if T2 first got the lock on A and T1 wants a lock, exclusive lock also on A, it cannot proceed. T2 will complete before T1 can proceed. So there will be no deadlocks here. So ordering is a very useful tool to prevent deadlocks and where possible you should do it. But it's not always possible because transactions can be very complex. This is a very simple pair of transactions. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, you have to detect deadlocks which are basically cyclic weights. So here is a set of transactions and the edge denotes who is waiting for who. This edge means T18 has a lock and T17 wants a lock in a mode which is not compatible with T18, therefore it has to wait for T18 and so forth. Here there is no problem. Uh, somebody is waiting for T20, T20 is not waiting for anybody. It will eventually finish unless it creates a deadlock later. If it doesn't create a deadlock, it will finish and go away. Now T18 is not waiting for anybody, it will finish and so forth. But here, we have a cycle, T18 to T waiting for T20, T20 waiting for T19, T19 waiting for T18. So this is a typical deadlock. So you have these graphs called a wait for graph and you look for cycles in the graph. It's pretty efficient to look for cycles. There's a simple DFS algorithm and lock managers typically implement this. So uh, once a deadlock happens, they will ask one of the transactions to roll back. Uh, there are again some issues on how far to roll back. It turns out that you can do partial rollbacks. Many systems supports that. Instead of completely aborting the transaction, you roll it back partially enough to release some locks 
and then allow the other transaction to get the lock and proceed. And then this transaction, which is partially rolled back, can go forward. This cannot always be done. The total rollback is the default. So uh, let me stop here. Uh, here's a quiz which you can read. And um, I'll tell you the answer in a few minutes. Meanwhile, I'll take questions. Sorry, there is a glitch in the slide. It says lock A of B. That this one. <laughs> this is a mistake. Uh, this should have been lock X of B. Okay. So uh, just pretend that uh, this thing is lock X, and do this thing. Meanwhile, we can take questions. We have uh, COE P Pune. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, actually, my question was regarding. Uh, can you throw some light on Mahut? Uh, morning we discussed about uh, Hadoop, yeah. but then there is one terminology called Mahut. Yeah. So Mahut is a data mining package which is built on top of uh, Hadoop MapReduce. It's Apache Mahout. There's a number of um, data mining algorithms which have been implemented using the MapReduce infrastructure, Hadoop. Uh, so you can actually run these on very large amounts of data. That is the idea. You want a data mining algorithm which are scalable to very large data. Now, if you go back to uh, standard data mining, it's been around for a while. There are many algorithms which are not very efficient. They will work beautifully on small data. But if you try to run it on really large amounts of data, they will die. Um, partly because they are very, uh, the complexity is very high. Um, but even those which don't have a high inherent complexity, if you have to run them serially, it would be very, very slow. So the idea of Mahout is to take those algorithms which are, uh, whose complexity is reasonable and uh, provide parallel implementations of those algorithms, which can be run on very large amounts of data. So that's what the Mahout project is about. You can go look it up on the net to find out more. Uh, so my question is on uh, the transaction concept. Uh, now, just now you talked about config serializability. Once we have uh, ensured that the schedule is config serializable, uh, do we need to check for view serializability also? Okay. The question is, if we have a schedule which is config serializable, uh, do we need to check separately for view serializability? The answer is that any config serializable schedule is also automatically view serializable. There is another notion of equivalence of schedules, which I don't have time to get into. And that notion is weaker than conflict serializability. In other words, there are schedules which are view serializable, which are not conflict serializable. But every conflict serializable schedule is definitely view serializable. Now, if you don't know what is view serializable, uh, you know, I don't have time to get into that here. Uh, but there are details on the book uh, slides and in the book itself. You can go read it up. Okay. Uh, We'll take some more live questions, but before that, let me take a good question from uh, chat. The question says, in an ATM machine, uh, when we withdraw some amount, uh, ATM machine will do the transaction and uh, you get a confirmation. But in some situations, uh, if the ATM machine does not have enough balance, it rolled back the transaction it committed earlier. Uh, so. Uh, why are they allowing a transaction to commit at the database before checking the amount available in the ATM? Okay, this is an example of a badly designed transaction. You know, this should not happen. If somebody has goofed up in the design, where you know they should have first uh, looked at the amount you asked for, check if the ATM machine has that amount because access to the ATM machine luckily is serial. Nobody, no two people can access the ATM machine at the same time. So you have the lock on the ATM machine while you are in front of it. So now, uh, they should have first checked if there is enough balance. Then, uh, they should have gone to the uh, database and checked if you have enough balance. And then let uh, you, you know, the transaction either proceed or tell you, no, you don't have enough balance. One of the two things should have been done, uh, either OK or not OK. But uh, I think what uh, this person is complaining about is that some bank has goofed up and there are situations where after the amount is deducted from the bank, then the ATM realizes it does not have enough money and then the transaction is rolled back in the bank. In fact, rollback in this case might mean uh, the, there's a fresh transaction which adds the amount back. Okay? So uh, this is a bad design, but sometimes other problems can happen. The ATM had enough money, 
uh, it was all ready, but uh, when uh, it tried to dispense the amount, maybe it is jammed. There is a mechanical problem. It is not able to dispense the amount. If it detects this, it will uh, run a transaction to credit the amount back in your bank balance. Uh, sometimes it may not detect it, uh, and uh, it may think you have actually got the money. Uh, then it becomes your headache. It is no longer the bank's headache, and you did not get the money, but you go back and check your uh, passbook, and you see that they have deducted the money. Then what to do? You go complain to the bank saying, hey, you are cheating. You did not give me the money. Then the bank may say, uh, you know, they may go back to the ATM and check the balance there. If the, the extra money in the ATM, that is proof that it did not give you the money. Um, in addition, most ATMs also have a camera to record what is happening. In case there is fraud, they know who was, they, can, they have a picture of whoever was there. So now that uh, picture can show whether uh, the money actually came out of the machine or not. Of course, if you say that, hey, I uh, asked for 15,000, the ATM machine gave me 14,500, that is uh, harder to prove using the video. But maybe even in that case, they can check the balance cash in the ATM machine and check. In some cases, they may decide you are uh, not lying and give you the money. There is a bigger issue here uh, that so far we have looked at transactions inside the database. But the ATM machine is a classic example of transactions that happen outside the database. And here I have already given you an intuition of how this is handled. A transaction happens in the database, it is committed, your balance is deducted. Then the rest of the transaction happens outside the database. If everything goes well, that is fine. If something goes wrong outside the database, some corrective measure has to be taken to conceptually roll back the transaction in the database. But it is too late. The transaction is committed in the database. So the trick is to have a compensating transaction. In this case, a transaction which credits the money back into the account. If you see your passbook, you will see two entries. You will see a debit followed by a credit. So it is not transparent to you. It is clear that something happened which was rolled back. It is not atomic in that sense. But uh, you are happy that your money is back and you are willing to overlook the fact that there was a debit and a credit. Uh, so that is acceptable in the banking scenario. Uh, we have Vivekananda, uh, Tamil Nadu, Tirichangot. Please go ahead, Vivekananda. How does HDFS get a good throughput in Hadoop? How does HDFS uh, give good throughput in Hadoop? Okay. So first of all, uh, uh, you know, Hadoop is not necessarily a super efficient implementation. It is very widely used because it is open source, it is free, but you are paying a price in that uh, stuff is done in Java, there are some overheads for doing it in Java. And uh, HDFS is also written in Java, which means HDFS also has uh, overheads due to Java. Uh, so there is uh, some price for all of this. If you uh, compare uh, with what Google does. Uh, their uh, GFS and their MapReduce are all written in C or uh, C++ or some other dialect of C. So their implementation is likely to be far more efficient. But um, uh, Yahoo and Apache went with Hadoop because there is uh, two issues here. One is the efficiency of execution, the other is efficiency, you know, uh, issues because of programmer error. Now, if you are running a C program and it has an error, uh, it, first of all, it is harder to debug C programs. They generally have a lot more errors. So there are going to be a lot more runs where uh, people run something and get a wrong output program crashes and so forth. Uh, those problems are less in Java. Uh, so programmer productivity goes up, but it is at certainly at some cost in terms of the throughput that you can get. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, that is a price you pay. Um, so now people are providing, for example, uh, Hive, which is SQL based, but the underlying implementation they are moving to um, a non Java platform, which might be faster. Now, that in turn runs on top of HBase, uh, which itself is, I think, Java based. So, yeah, Java has some overheads, um, but you know, it is a trade off. You could get some improvement by using C, but Java is not so bad. It is not uh, horribly inefficient. It is a little less efficient, but not horribly so. So, it is considered good enough for most applications. Uh, Royal College, Kerala, please go ahead. Sir, I use CloudSim for doing some uh, simulations in cloud. 
Can I relay this uh, Hado with uh, Cloud Sim? Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with Cloud Sim, but uh, I believe it is something which lets you simulate uh, what would happen if you were running in the cloud. Is that what it is? I, I'm not used to it, so I'm not sure. So without knowing exactly what is Cloud Sim, I cannot relate it to Hadoop. But from the name, it sounds like a simulator uh, which can simulate long distance delays and so forth, uh, which would reflect what you would see if you were running something in the cloud. So if, if you're running in the cloud, the problem is that when you're communicating with a service which is running on the cloud, it's going to take a long time for your packet to get from here to there. For example, if your service is running in the US, you're looking at uh, several hundred millisecond delay uh, for uh, packets to get there, which is partly simply because of uh, speed of light delays, and then partly because there are many routers along the way, each of which may introduce some delay. Uh, so I think CloudSim, if I'm not mistaken, uh, helps you see what will happen if you do something in such a setting. And it has no relation to Hadoop, but I may be wrong because I don't know exactly what is cloud sim. So if you have a follow-up, please ask. Otherwise, leave it at that. OK, we have uh, Sasuri College, Tamil Nadu. Please go ahead. Uh, my question is, can you give us a simple ex explanation for difference between DBMS, RDBMS, and ORDBMS, over DBMS? A difference between uh, relational, object-oriented, and object-relational. Now, this sounds like exactly the kind of question you should not be asking in exams. But I see, unfortunately, many exams ask people to define concepts like this. So I will refuse to answer such a question. And I will strongly urge you not to ask such questions anywhere. Okay? I, I know you're asking the question because such questions come in exams. Uh, but uh, we need to reform our exam system. I'm going completely off topic, but uh, you have triggered off something which I've been meaning to say during this workshop. I didn't get the chance. And the point is that uh, we want to ask questions which test some deeper understanding. Now, how does it matter, uh, you know, how an ORDBMS is defined, how an ORDBMS is defined? Can you define Hinduism? Can you define uh, Islam? Can you define, uh, you know, uh, a car? Does it matter? Okay, does, do we care about it? Can, you know, do, there's a war going on between cars versus quadricycles versus auto rickshaws, if you are familiar with that debate, uh, defining these things. It may matter to some people, but for you, you get in, sit, and it takes you somewhere. That's what matters. And then you focus on things which really matter. And that's the same kind of attitude we should have towards databases. Focus on things which matter, and sometimes things which are intellectually stimulating, which lead to some very interesting things. So maybe normalization uh, is kind of less important today because ER modeling takes care of most of the issues. But it's still a very nice topic intellectually, and it's good to expose students to some such uh, deeper uh, mathematical topics in any area. Uh, so you want to look at either mathematical elegance or practical importance, and then ask questions which are related to that to test the understanding of the student in that area. So if you ask a student to write an SQL query, or to find a bug in an SQL query, or to fill in the blanks to complete an SQL query, these are all things which require understanding. Uh, defining an ORDBMS, ORDBMS, you know, you can look up the definition on the web if you care. Um, and it's described in the textbook, uh, so go look it up. But please don't ask such questions in exams. And like I said, for the same reason, I will not answer it. I will say, go look it up on the web or in textbooks. If you have any other question, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is a small doubt. Uh, in normalization for the ORDBMS, how to implement it for the hash table and to the hash mapping table? How to implement in normalization for the mapping storage? Okay, how to implement a hash table? Uh, so uh, there's plenty of uh, you know code available in textbooks on how to implement a hash table. Any algorithms textbook will talk about it. Now the difference in a database is that uh, if you are building a persistent hash table in a database, that means the Contents have to reside on disk and should survive uh, system shutdown and restart. That's the main difference from an in-memory hash table. Now, if you look at practical implementations, yes, uh, Oracle did implement uh, hash organized uh, tables with hash file organization. Uh, and uh, essentially, they created a file with a number of blocks. A hash function would identify a block in the file, and the record would be stored there. Uh, and what if the block is full? that block would have a pointer to an overflow block, and you would go there. Um, so this kind of thing was implemented. 
there are some issues with this. What if the table grows? You need a hash function which hashes to more blocks. So again, people came up with other implementations of these. Uh, but in the end, it turned out that uh, they did not offer any major advantages practically over B plus trees. So today, uh, practically speaking, Oracle, uh, you know, I do not know if they still even support it. They kind of say do not use hash file organization. PostgreSQL also did more or less the same thing. So all of them have uh, just standardized on B plus trees because there was no major benefit to hash table organizations which are used for storing relations. But in memory hashing is used widely in all the query evaluation systems. They, they all have it because it, in memory hashing is much faster than having a in memory uh, search tree. So that is used. D did that answer your question or was it something else? Back to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, what is this? Raisoni Institute, uh, Pune. So my question is, uh, what is the uh, optimistic concurrency control? Okay, let me answer that. The question was on what is optimistic concurrency control. Uh, I have a few slides on that which I had planned to finish today, uh, but because yesterday's topic rolled over to today, a bit of today's has rolled over into tomorrow. So I will uh, cover uh, optimistic concurrency control very briefly tomorrow. Uh, however, uh, even tomorrow there are other topics, so I won't be able to get into it in detail. So if you are really interested in this, um, it is available in the book. But to summarize it, since you asked the question. Optimistic concurrency control essentially uh, lets a transaction proceed uh, without locking, but keeps track of what it read and what it wrote. So based on these read and write sets, when the transaction is ready to commit, it makes a call to see if any other concurrent transaction has a conflict based on the read and write sets with this transaction. If there is no conflict with any other concurrent transaction which uh, committed earlier, this transaction is allowed to commit. Uh, that is in summary what optimistic concurrency control. It is called optimistic because you allow it to run uh, assuming that there will be no problem till it is ready to commit. At that point, you will compare its read and write sets with the read and write sets of all transactions which were concurrent, meaning they were running while this was running, but committed before this one. That is the intuition. Uh, so the details uh, we will look at very briefly tomorrow, but uh, if you are interested in it, uh, you can go ahead and read it up. It is there in the book chapter. Any other question? Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We have uh, Tandai Periya, Velur. Please go ahead. What happens if we give, if we give the entire SQL date function mm -hmm. month more than 12? Month more than 12. Is, there, is it valid or is there any constraint? Yeah, so a month more than 12 would be invalid, uh, clearly. So uh, that, uh, you know, so the way you do it is uh, you say date and then a string. So it will, uh, it should give a syntax error. If it does not, that is a bug in the implementation. Uh, there is another issue of seconds beyond, uh, uh, you know, 0 to 59 is normally the allowed seconds. Occasionally you have a leap second. So, uh, second with a value of 60 might be required, uh, so that may be allowed, but a month beyond uh, 12 should not be allowed. Any other question from you? So, what is this software tool available to maintain RAID? Okay. So, question is how do you set up RAID with software? Now, uh, Linux comes with uh, RAID tools built in. So when you install Linux, uh, you have to do a little bit of work uh, to uh, tell it that uh, you know this set of uh, disks uh, should be uh, kept in a RAID mode. So if you're familiar with Linux installation, uh, the initial uh, setup steps where you do hard disk partitioning and so on, at that point you can uh, modern uh, Linux installer uh, will let you define a RAID right at that point. And the software is built into Linux. You don't have to install any new software. Uh, for Windows, also, I suspect the same thing holds. Uh, but I have not set up a RAID with Windows, so I can't say for sure. This is for software RAID. Again, software RAID has some drawbacks. You should not be using it for, uh, you know, bank accounts and such like. It's perfectly fine for your desktop computer, maybe even for your department computer. Uh, but it's not good enough for a bank, where if you lose the last transaction, it means a lot. 
for you if you lost the last uh, file which you saved, big deal. But for a bank, if you lost the last transaction, then there is a problem. Uh, back to you if you have any other question. Sir, what is the command to know what are the servers or applications are running in Ubuntu? Okay, you want to know what all uh, servers, applications running in Ubuntu. Uh, so, uh, you in Linux, in, uh, not just Ubuntu, any version of Linux, uh, there is a ps command. Uh, the ps command normally tells you what processes you are running. So, if you say ps space minus ax, it will tell you what all processes are running in the system, all processes, whether they are services or user processes or whatever. Mm. But let us, uh, you know, stick to database questions here. Support for that, sir. We will note down the command. Yeah. So, uh, it is not a database question. I really do not want to spend too much time, but this particular one might be useful to you. So, it is ps space minus ax. ps is what processes are running. Similarly, uh, ls will show you what all files are in a directory. If you want to know their sizes and so on, you can say ls minus al. Uh, so, these two might be useful for you in your uh, Hadoop uh, assignment, because uh, the way we have asked you to run Hadoop requires a little bit of command line. So, you have to open a shell script and run it. So, I think it is worth uh, showing these two commands to you. Hello. Uh, yeah. What is the abbreviation for pnet? You mean expansion for peanuts. <laughs> um, that is a good question. Uh, in fact, uh, peanuts uh, was built by uh, my PhD advisor, Raghu Ramakrishnan. And when I visited him, I asked him, you know, how did you come up with this term peanuts? So, his claim is there was a bottle of peanuts on his table uh, and he had to come up with a name. So, he says peanuts. <laughs> I do not know if you, I do not think he was serious, uh, but there is no official expansion for peanuts. So, let us just assume it is just peanuts. <laughs> any other interesting questions? Sir, like is there any automatic software? Uh, is there any automatic software available for doing schedule in transactions, sir? So, you want software for scheduling in transactions. Well, first of all, uh, the scheduling, or uh, once you submit your query to the database, uh, the database is handling all the scheduling decisions. You cannot control it externally. It is all internal to the database. Uh, now, if you want to uh, control when the uh, different transactions submit things to the database, that kind of scheduling, I am um, not familiar with. Uh, I, I know there are uh, software packages available for deciding on scheduling for, you know, like other things. If you have uh, uh, construction or some other such activity, so you create, uh, pro, uh, you know, steps, dependencies between steps. And then you can get uh, sh charts for scheduling these. Uh, normally, in databases, this kind of uh, issues don't come up. So I don't know of specific scheduling software. Uh, but for specific application, like real-time databases, um, people have shown that certain ways of doing scheduling might be better than certain other ways. Uh, so people have built uh, schedulers for real-time systems. Uh, but again, you need to get into the database to uh, build it in the database. You can't do it externally. If you have access to PostgreSQL, you might be able to hack the PostgreSQL code to build it. And maybe people have done it, but I, I'm not familiar with uh, what tools are actually available. There's a lot of research on this. Uh, practical tools, I'm not sure. Okay, last question. Sir, can, can we insert couples in a relation with special information? a tuple with spatial information into a relation. Yes, I think I mentioned this earlier. Um, there are uh, uh, types for spatial data which are uh, part of PostgreSQL extensions. Oracle has it. You can certainly uh, insert tuples. There is also syntax for this. You can go read it up. Oracle spatial extensions or PostgreSQL, PostGIS, uh, which is uh, Postgres with some extra data types for spatial data. Uh, I think we should perhaps stop here.